Madame Bovary is acclaimed as the first modern novel, the first psychological novel. The author, Gustave Flaubert, is justly famous as a meticulous prose stylist who was always in search of, as he called it, le mot juste, the proper word. But today we're going to look at his use of the three-part structure, a very simple, very elegant structure, which is the same structure that you will find in the vast majority of novels still being written today. It is so popular, the three-part structure, largely because it, it contains the three essential elements of story. You've got your beginning, your middle, and your end. So let's look at how Flaubert's use of this structure adds to the emotional resonance of Madame Bovary. And today I've brought the visuals, so let's get into it. Hey, Stunt Reader here. The aim of this channel is to help you level up your craft as a novelist by learning to actively read novels, in your genre and out, both classic and contemporary, to figure out what it is that makes these stories so emotionally compelling to so many people. If that's of interest to you, please subscribe and ding that notification bell so you'll be sure to know when I upload my next video. Active reading is one of the easiest and most reliable ways to take your writing skills to the next level. So let's get reading. So Madame Bovary uses a three-part structure. Flaubert divides his book into part one, part two, part three. So you couldn't have a clearer example. Part one in my translation, the Modern Library edition, translated by Francis Stiegmuller, is nine chapters, came in at 76 pages. Part two is 15 chapters, came in at 180 pages, and part three is 11 chapters, came in at 132 pages. And that's pretty classic for this structure as well, for the middle, the middle part, the build, to be longer um, by a factor of two compared to your beginning and your end. So about 25%, these numbers are all very fluid, but about 25% for your uh, beginning or the hook, about 50% for the middle, the build, and a, another 25% for your ending or the payoff. In Madame Bovary, it winds up being 20%, 47%, 33%, but these are all well within the ranges of perfectly acceptable. The problem with the three-part structure is thinking of it, though, in terms of three equal parts, and then it becomes unbalanced. If the, if the beginning is overly long, or the ending is overly long, or the middle is overly short, and not enough happens to really progress and complicate things, the proportions can feel off. So keep that in mind with the three-part structure. But I brought some visual aids, so let's get into those right now. So this is a chart that I made to visually represent the three-part structure of Madame Bovary. What it's charting here on this slide is chapter length in terms of pages. Don't worry, I did not count words. I haven't gone completely insane. Um, because I wanted to look at how Flaubert varies his chapters to uh, heighten the emotional intensity at points, but also to, at other times, to underscore some of his themes. So you can see here, I have my cursor nice and big, part one, part two, and part three. The, these are the dividing lines between the parts. And this dotted line here is the average chapter length, which was 11 pages. So you can see he varies his chapters from three, four pages, all the way up to 26 pages. I do wanna throw in a note of caution here. Lots of novelists are very consistent with their chapter length, and that is completely intentional. Consistent and also typically on the shorter side, the idea being that you want your chapters to be like potato chips, the potato chip length where- No, oh, just one more, one more, I can, I can have another. To keep the reader immersed, keep the reader turning the pages. But this has worked for Flaubert, obviously, and we're gonna take a look at why. So I wanted to look at the overall story arc, but also the arcs that are contained within each part. Let's look at the arc of part one. Part one is one story. Essentially, it is the courtship and marriage of Charles and Emma. Courtship, marriage, pregnancy, and departing toast. One story. Part two, they arrive in Yonvi, their new home, the new town, and get settled in. And the first part, 
is Emma meeting the young legal clerk, Leon, and they essentially conduct an emotional affair. They're flirting together. They are they are in love. They are way too timid, though, both of them, to actually push this into an actual physical affair. Because the middle build's a little longer, it often does have more than just the one story. This is this is where the you know things get complicated. So she and and Leon conduct their emotional affair. He departs, and then she begins an actual affair with Rodolphe in the second part of the middle build. And that actually starts pretty much uh, here at the Agricultural F Festival, which is a phenomenal chapter. That's the, the real tour de force chapter of the novel where Emma and Rodolphe are looking down at the festival from, a, from an upper story of a building nearby so they can look down over the plaza. And as the uh, speeches are going on and the medals are being handed out, the two of them are coming closer and closer and there's a lot of parallels between those speeches and the, and the awards and these two characters, it's, it's phenomenal. And then here, that brings us to the next chapters where the affair actually is consummated they take a horseback ride into the country and they do have sex that's the midpoint a very important part of the three-act structure of, of probably of any novel but of the three-part structure in particular is that midpoint it doesn't have to be exactly in the center but you'll notice in madame bovary it's precisely in the center chapter 18 is the central chapter this is where the affair is consummated. This is the often referred to as the crisis or the point of no return. And you couldn't get a better example either of a point of no return because once she crosses that line from an emotional flirtation into an actual physical affair, takes a lover, she says, I have a lover and she's, she's all giddy. Um, you can't, there's no going back at that point. So that is a clear point of no return. And the middle build is often divided into two parts. I don't want to get too complicated here. It's a it's a three part structure, a three act structure. But the middle bill, because it is a little longer, often is divided into a two A and a two B, and basically two A being what comes before the midpoint, two B being what comes after the midpoint. The the consequences of that point of no return, how the characters deal with what happened in that point of no return. The second part of the middle build then is Emma and Rodolphe's affair. And that actually takes the course of three years, much of which is dispatched by Flaubert very efficiently in summary. She pressures Rodolphe to take her away. He leads her on until the very day when they're supposed to leave, and then he drops her a letter saying, sorry, babe, can't go. <laughs> Gotta go hunt. And she's crushed. She uh, This throws her into a tailspin. So we have the first half is Emma and Leon's emotional affair. The second half is Emma and Rodolphe's physical affair. And then at the very end, Leon comes back into the picture. And that kicks us into part three. So part three, uh, the affair with Leon begins. And now uh, through part two, there has been a number of uh, interactions with LaRue, the, the merchant, who has been advancing to Emma, all sorts of things on credit. And as the Leon affair proceeds, debt begins to, the, the debt intensifies and creditors start calling on her to pay it. Um, she can't come up with the money. She starts going around begging for first Leon and then the notary and then the tax collector and then ultimately Rodolphe for just a loan to help cover her debts so that she won't be discovered. Um, so that Charles won't realize what a hash she's made of the family finances, gets rejected on all fronts, and that's when she commits suicide. If part two had two stories that were sequential, this is two stories in parallel. One is the story of her affair with Leon proceeding and devolving into bickering and ultimately her realizing um, an affair can be just as banal as a marriage. Parallel to that running, un running uh, under that, is the the debt coming due both literally and metaphorically and that leads to her suicide which is the climax of the novel that is the emotional peak of the novel and as you can see the second to longest chapter a horrible drawn out death and then in the last chapter charles actually meets rodolph buys the guy a beer and 
God bless him, and sits opposite him and, and just wishes that he could have been this guy because this is the guy that, that Emma actually loved or as close as, as possible for her to come. And then Charles goes home and dies of sheer lameness. <laughs> so, so that's the overall structure. And you can see his chapters are vary quite a bit. He's not afraid to go long with a chapter when there is a lot going on and when he is, for example, when he's drawing his two lovers together at the agricultural festival, it's longer when Emma is desperate and begging Rodolphe and then committing suicide, eating the arsenic. That's a longer chapter. And yet some of the chapters are very short, and you'll notice that those are all honeymoon periods. These are the times when she's actually happy, but these are given three, three pages, four pages, and that is completely consistent with Flaubert's theme that Emma just cannot be happy for very long. So I, I really like the way, and Emma and Leon flirting, these are sort of the good days as well between her and Leon. You have the honeymoon period here with Leon when, after they've consummated their affair. So those are the very short chapters because she can't be happy for long. So let's look at another slide that I made, and this is, this is purely subjective. This slide is the reflects a score of emotional intensity on a scale of one to 25. I just wanted a scale that was close to the chapter length scale as well. And I graded the emotional intensity of each chapter, weighting it heavily toward how intense it was for Emma, but also the characters around her and myself as a reader. So this is completely subjective. I used, I used the units of emotes which uh, I'm sure you're familiar with. <laughs> Here you can see the peaks and valleys of the novel. This dotted line underneath, pale line, shows, the, um, shows it ramping up, the emotional intensity ramping as the novel goes. But you have some peaks here. You have Obisar's party where Emma, like I said, is swept off her feet, uh, enchanted by the upper class, basically, and, and you know, feeling, why, why can't I be living like this? And then it, it drops back down to baseline when they arrive in the new town, starts to pick up as she and Leon begin to flirt, and then he leaves for Rouen, and then things pick up with Rodolphe. And then when the affair begins, that is definitely a peak. That is when uh, they take their horseback ride into the countryside. That is the midpoint. That is the point of no return. And then you have some other spikes, including when Rodolphe ends the affair. Uh, that's an, an emotionally intense uh, scene for her as well. So that is a, another peak. And you can really see this as sort of the peak of the first part of the middle build. And then this is the peak of the second part. Then she's down in the dumps. And then the affair with Leon begins. That's intense. Things start to pick up then as the debt intensifies. And then ultimately leading to the emotional peak of the novel, the climax where she does eat the arsenic. So Again, this is purely subjective, but it, I think it does show how each part has its own peaks and valleys and how Flaubert structured those. And now we're gonna take a look at, this is why I wanted to have the scales be comparable, just to overlay, again, very subjective. The chapter length is the brown or the tan and the emotional intensity is the gray. And you can see they track fairly well. There's some discrepancies here with the honeymoon periods because I rated those a little higher just because she's happy. That's a good emotional intensity. But the chapters are very short, again, in keeping with Flaubert's theme. So you have some discrepancies there. But uh, again, here, long, second longest chapter, the emotional peak of the book, those track. Uh, Leona Fair begins, that tracks. These two uh, are have some discrepancies, but if you sort of take these two as a whole, this this midpoint as a whole, the Emma coming together with Rodolphe and then the affair beginning, if you take those two chapters together, which is fudging it a little bit, that they, they also track then too. Flaubert was not afraid to write a longer chapter to ramp up the emotional intensity, really pull us into the scene. So this is just a little map that I made to also talk about the structure of the book but in terms of the physical locations of the characters, physical locations of the affairs and how that fits in with the structure and fits in with Flaubert's theme. So this is at the beginning of part two, that first half of part two, where the Bovarys have moved to Yonvi, 
they take a house on Main Street, effectively, uh, a short walk from uh, Omey's house, the apothecary's house. And uh, Leon, the, as a legal clerk, he lives on the third floor of Homé's house. So they're just a short walk from each other. It's just an emotional affair, a flirtation. They see each other very frequently. She, Emma, will often sit in the window to watch him walk by, that sort of thing. So still, though, at her home, staying close to home, close to Charles. The second part, once the affair with Rodolphe begins, now Rodolphe lives out of town, so it's a long walk across fields, which she makes and he at times makes to her place as well. But you can see this pulling her away from home now that there is that separation um, from her husband, from her home, and also from herself, really, as she gets more and more alienated from herself as these affairs go on and as the debt com continues to accrue. And then in part three, once the affair begins with Leon, now she has to go even further from home to have that affair continue. She takes the Hirondelle. They didn't have a carriage icon, so I used a little bus there. That's effectively what she was doing, was taking the bus to get to Rouen to meet Leon. So you can see that as the affairs go on, she becomes progressively, moves progressively further from her home and also becomes increasingly alienated, I believe, from herself. And then it's interesting, as the debts start to come due, notice that she first appeals to Leon, far away here, her lover. Uh, he's like, 5,000 francs, where am I going to get that? No way. Uh, so then she goes back not to Rodolphe yet, but she does go back to the notary, uh, Guillaume, who wants to trade its sexual favors for an advance, which she refuses. Good on her. But he's outside of town, so but it, you get that sense of now the walls starting to close in, her options becoming more and more limited, limited driving her back toward her home. She then goes to beg uh, Binet, the tax collector, who's a neighbor, I think even a next door neighbor, or lives very close, so getting, again, pulling, dragging her closer to home. He refuses, and now she's confronted with having to go home, realizing that she's going to have to confront the truth, confront her husband. He's going to discover what a hash she's made of their lives, of their finances, and that's the last thing that she wants to confront. And so that pushes her then back out to Rodolphe to beg him for money, and he finally rejects her and she comes back home and then goes across the main street to Omey's house to where she finds the arsenic. So again, the, the affairs take her further away and then the debts pull her further back until she finally sort of collapses like a black hole at, the, at home and uh, dies in a horrible, gruesome manner. So just to recap, the three parts, the middle build was the longest of the three, the first part was the shortest, and that contained one story. That was the story of Emma and Charles, their, their courtship, marriage, and pregnancy. The second part, the longest, contained two sequential stories. First, the story of Emma and Leon's affair, then the story of Emma and Rodolphe's affair, built to that midpoint, that point of no return, and then the actions, the consequences that flowed out of that. And then the third part, also shorter than the middle, was included two parallel stories, which was the story of Emma's affair with Leon pulling her further away, and then the debts coming due pulling her further back in until she finally collapses uh, at, into the truth uh, of her own character at the end. I wouldn't necessarily have made these charts for myself, although I must say once I started making them just as a tool, a visual tool to share online, I found more and more things that I was learning about the book through the process of doing that. And that really is one of the key techniques of active reading is to start making notes, making maps, making charts of the things that you've read. Another way to do it instead of emotional intensity might be the valence of the chapter, the, the emotional direction. Is it on and up for the protagonist? Is it on and down? Many, many novels use the three-part structure and you really can't get a better illustration of what that is, what that entails than 
Madame Bovary. I hope you got some value from this discussion of the three-part structure of Madame Bovary. If so, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe and ding that notification bell so you'll be sure to know when I upload my next video. I think I would like to do another one on Madame Bovary, on Flaubert, on his paragraphs, on his descriptive paragraphs, because they can certainly serve as a good model for our own descriptive writing. Till then, keep reading, keep writing.